question, which is uh, going to be the one with, with, with Joe, who's going to talk about from Power CLI to API. So that's that's the main the main session today. Um, the the agenda looks like this. So yeah, we're doing a little introduction. Then we have Joe talking about a Power CLI to API, and afterwards I have a, a small little session about um, using PowerShell ChatGPT and Script Runner. And um, yeah, for those of you who maybe the first time are in our in this session with our user group. Ryan and I, we founded this way back in 2019, and then it went on hiatus, as uh, yeah, many other things. And so we restarted it beginning of the year, and this is actually the fourth one already for this year. So this, this is really cool. And um, if you if you want to follow up, you obviously already are a member of the user group on our meetup, which by the way, we just reached uh, in. A, a nice uh, threshold. We have now 201 members um, of our in our user group. Yay! Who poops? Awesome. Uh, <laughs> hi, Emrys. And, uh, and um, you can also follow us on on Twitter. Uh, and uh, the videos are available here on YouTube. And um, yeah, I, we, you, if you if you follow Ryan and me uh, on our user group, you will get all the information. And Scriptrunner, the company I'm accidentally working with, uh, is, is sponsoring uh, the user group. So we're paying for the meetup costs and stuff like that. And uh, if, if you're not already have one of our PowerShell goodies, like posters about PowerShell and stuff like that, you are very welcome to go to our website and get that. It's like a, a little cheat sheets and get helps or in, in the PDF format and also for your office wall. All right. So with this, without further ado, Brian, anything you want to add from your side? No, you kicked it off just right. Um, <laughs> so nothing else to add. Perfect. So Joe, let's let's see if if you're. If you can share, you should yep. be able to share the screen. Let's get to. Yeah, we just do full screen. Okay, it's coming across. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Everybody waving. Great. Me. Looks good. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to it. So, howdy, y'all. I'm Joe Hughes. I'm here to lead this session that is titled "From Power CLI to API." This is about taking your automation skills to the next level. Honestly, for any of us who use uh, PowerShell, who have done things with VMware or can even just kind of conceptually understand this, this is really just about taking things to the next small incremental steps a little bit at a time so we can we can move along and, and kind of play with some different stuff. So who am I and why am I here? Uh, currently, I'm a senior solutions architect at Pure Storage, um, but really the reason that I'm presenting this is I'm a co-leader for the Denver PowerShell and VMware user groups. I'm absolutely a serial collector of communities. Um, I will give the quick rundown on what these all are at the end of this slide. Uh, I'm normally easy to find in a crowd. I've got either the green, the orange, or the colored hat with, uh, you know, doing travel today. This is my, my personal brand. Uh, and you can always spot me with the big grin and the loud howdy y'all. Um, I have very little shame. Really, I have basically no shame when it comes to presenting the user groups. And I just like to share my learnings with others. Um, if somebody can get to the end of, of seeing some of these things in action or understanding better ways to do it by seeing my mistakes, then I feel like, you know, I've, I've done my part to, you know, make the experience and the journey a little bit easier for someone else. But I always challenge everyone to push themselves to learn more and don't fear sharing, even if it's sharing things that you have done incorrectly um, or things that you have figured out um, and somebody gives you feedback of, oh, hey, that's great. Here's another option. Here's another idea. Here's another way to do it. That's a really good conversation. And you may never have that conversation if you're not sharing what things you are doing. I also push people to share your knowledge. Your perspective is important. I can do this session. This is probably the 20 fourth time or something I've given the same presentation but I have had many times where I have finished giving the session somebody has come up and asked a question and someone else in the audience explained it in a different way and and the person asking the question understood it better than me giving a presentation because they just stated it in a way that their learning or their process or just their method of explaining it made more sense to the audience. So share your knowledge because your perspective and, and the way that you do things, the way that you think about it and the way that you explain it is always important. 
And I always push people to teach whatever you can, right? This comes out of, out of Be the Master, especially anybody that, that knows PowerShell or has followed um, any of the books. You know you know the Bible of, of starting with PowerShell is Learn PowerShell in a Month of Lunches that was written by Don Jones and Jeff Hicks. Don uh, originally put up a blog post, ooh, man, sometime in 2017. I should remember when this is by now. That was titled Be the Master. His, his original version was a little bit rougher. It was actually be the master, get out of the way. But this is about bringing the apprentice journeyman master um, methodology of what exists in crafts or what used to exist in things like blacksmithing uh, back in medieval times, where part of your job was by being a master, you were there to train and to share and to teach others so that your skills were not lost uh, when you no longer did the work or when you were no longer around. So I challenge everybody to teach. Right. You can. Being on, but you see the tone of these guys, right? So that's, that's good. Okay. okay. All right, thanks. Travel safe. Okay. Can you all hear me? I think I lost audio for a second there. No, we can hear you. Okay, good. All right. Uh, and then, yeah, finally, uh, job versus career. I always try and make this point to everybody. Um, sorry finishing off on, on teach whatever you can even if it is not technical if it is you teaching a life skill to someone or just a way that you do something in a way that you think about something again that perspective and whatever you can do to teach somebody is important and and be willing to give that back to the community i at least ask everyone to not only consume but to contribute to the communities that they are a member of there's always some you can help um, so look for those opportunities that will absolutely enrich your life and your career to do that. And then specifically on job versus career, your job belongs to your employer, your career belongs to you, right? So your job might change tomorrow, whether that's your choice, your employer's choice, or, or completely outside of the control of both of your uh, employer and yourself. But if you are driving your career and if you are pushing yourself to do things to achieve the goals that you want, then you're in a much better place. So I, I always try and challenge people to actively uh, yeah, be the driver of their career and, and really push themselves. And then because I, I had a good buddy of mine who says, you know, as you're doing all of these things, you really need to kind of be a little bit better at the self-promotion. Um, I, I hate doing this portion of the slides because I feel like this is just bragging for no reason. Um, but I, I do have a bit of crossover from doing so many different things with the community and the different user groups. So the, the current list of accolades that I've got right now are being a VMUG leader, being a Microsoft MVP, being a VMware vExpert, being a Veeam Vanguard, Tanzu Vanguard, Cisco champion. I also help co-host the um, V Brown Bag podcast uh, for doing essentially like open non-vendor specific webinars on Wednesday night to just get the community talking and learning. Um, but the big thing to me is I've gotten to where I am in my career and I've, I've stumbled my way through figuring out how to no longer be an introvert or not be as introverted as I was previously to do some of the public speaking, to, to be less fearful about sharing and presenting even things that I do poorly. Um, but it's gotten me to a place where I, this, this uh, January, I think I took over as the chief technology officer for my uh, local dads group, we actually have a nonprofit that is our community outreach, and we have brought in and paid out, I think the current total is $987,000 US in charitable funds in a little bit less than four years that we've been incorporated. This was just a group of dads who started up originally even just a Facebook group, and we just wanted to make things better in our local actual communities, not just on the on the tech side of things. Um, but having so many people involved in this group that have wide backgrounds, that people have tons of different experience and that we were just trying to do the neighborly thing of helping each other out and then helping out our town and our local community. We've had some amazing impacts. So I always, again, try and challenge people to not only focus on the technology, but do real things in the real world. Um, it's, it's absolutely made me a, a happier person that, that the skills that I picked up in tech could, could really start you know, making a difference outside of this. And also, I never want to let anybody have this stuff scare them. This should not be your first reaction to working with code or working with APIs. You know, none of this is really ever that bad. So starting at the beginning, number one, I always try and tell everybody to define a goal, right? You always want to know where you're starting, where you're trying to end. And I tell people, especially when you're working on code projects or when you're going to start trying to learn something new, 
think about tasks and measurable results, right? You want to kind of really, really, really define what's your end state and how do you think you are going to get there? I always want everybody to plan for success, right? You're always going to encounter like issues, changes you're going to have to do. There's going to be failures. There's going to be stumbles. You might have to revise that goal. Um, but you want to start with something because if you plan for success, you are much more likely to get a positive result at the end of this. Specifically with code, speed and performance are a great advantage of the things that you are doing, but that's not the true benefit of automation to your organization. The things that you want when you are working on automation are the results and the process improvements that you get from doing a lot of these things. One of the biggest things that I had some feedback that like the, the best way to try and pitch doing uh, automation projects to a business is to actually tell the management that by doing automation, you are forcing the documentation of a business process. Because even when you're doing automation on the tech side, you are still working on a business process. And then the things you really want to focus on as you're working in code and as you're trying to, to especially move from doing things at the, at the CLI or within PowerShell and trying to move towards working with APIs and having systems in place that are talking to each other, you want standardization, you want validation, and you want to think about the efficiencies gained. There are many things that a computer is better at doing than we are. So what you want to do is skill up, learn the things that you need to, to get these systems to do something they are better at than you. And then you go to lunch or you go home, right? You're not spending all of your time um, focusing on things that are better handled by another system. And you can work on smarter and harder problems for your company. But the way that we get there for a lot of this, I, I like to steal this out of the software development world. You really need to think about small incremental changes that can be verified. You need to think about minimum viable product, right? You want to achieve that next task that you have in your goal and in your plan. So you don't tackle things too quickly or too much all at once, right? You're not trying to make a thousand lines of code revision. You're trying to tweak one and get it working. And now that you have that, hopefully you're even putting it in source control and saying, here's a commit where this functions, this works. Here's my notes for where I was at. Now I go work on the next step, right? You don't try and do everything all at once. And then I really, really enjoy presenting specifically on PowerShell and, and even teaching people that know nothing about VMware um, in this way and using vCenter in a VMware environment typically helps a lot because of the fact that PowerShell is easy. It's human readable, right? People can follow someone's code and have a, a decent understanding of what it's doing just based on the, the structure of the verb dash noun, you know, commandlet style that we have. And again, even if nobody knows anything about VMware, most of us can grasp the concept of a virtual machine, right? It's, it's an object. It's got resources attached to it for CPU, memory, uh, network and a disk, right? So it's it's very understandable that there are things that exist for that, right? So it's in the PowerShell stance, it's properties, the attributes of that object that you have in a virtual machine. And then there are actions you can take against it, right? Turning it on, turning it off, deleting the thing, uh, moving it around in, inside of an environment. So even if you don't know all the terminology of everything on, on VMware, if you just think of it in the in the perspective of PowerShell, right? It's still just an object and everybody can kind of understand the, the abstract of, of some resources that are on it. But I always try and push people to remember the PowerShell basics that all of us hopefully learned as we were, you know, figuring it out for the first time. So get dash help is your friend and it makes your life easier, right? Thinking about the fact that PowerShell came out of being started in a Windows system and it was it was intended to be a functional scripting and operations language for operators on Windows, if you do things like go look at the help for, you know, get service, get process, you can see lots and lots of examples that are from that operator perspective of what it is that you are trying to do functionally, interactively at the command line. But you have to think about this as well in just the community aspect. If you need help, just ask for help, right? Whether that is looking through documentation or asking somebody else, most of us want you to succeed and are willing to share and help somebody else get to that end result faster, right? So consider asking for help, whether that's, you know, again, in the documentation or, you know, in public on a forum. And then PowerShell, it is absolutely built for the pipeline. So you need to embrace and utilize this concept and this methodology, especially in this instance, as we're looking at trying to move to APIs and trying to link systems together, you need to really kind of think about that concept of getting an object, taking interactions against it, 
understanding what objects that you have that you're currently working with and how to wire that up to the next thing that you are trying to do. And then stacking commandlets and results like Lego. I, I always enjoy this one because this, this brings me back to putting together one of my favorite Lego sets, which was the, uh, the Voltron Lego set that I put together with my kids when I came back from a, a week-long conference. And for, I think, six or seven days, basically, all we did was put together all the pieces of, of this set, which was just, for me, a fantastic experience and, and getting the perspective of trying to explain to my little kids you know, how to put together Lego and how to follow instructions and do things in the right order. Um, it gave me an interesting perspective of trying to teach people the basics of stuff. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I really, really enjoy doing one-on-one level content for a lot of this stuff, because it's, to me, that's, that's some stuff that's very helpful or if it's done decently well, I won't say that I do it very well, <laughs> but if it's done decently well, you know, people are not scared off by seeing some of these basic things, but looking at Lego sets, if you look at the end result of what you have, Somebody who just looks at that finished result doesn't realize and understand all the pieces and parts that go into it. Like a lot of times there's even hidden pieces that are that are really cool, interesting colors that you would never see on what's the, the box picture essentially at the end of it. But this also puts you in the mindset of doing those minimum viable product type tasks, right? You are doing one step at a time. You have to order these things properly. You have to put things in place in the right way. Otherwise, when you have flipped a page or two and are trying to do the next step, if something was not put together properly previously, then you don't have the, the correct result that is you taking the next step from where you're at currently. You have to go back and fix some things, right? So you have to think about things that you were trying to do. And especially if you're trying to get into advanced scripting, if you're trying to do anything with, uh, with functions and with modules, you want to keep things as simple as possible. You want it to do one thing and have it do that one thing well. And then if you need to change or modify or, or get a different result from that, the minimum viable product is making a small iterative change to modify the thing that is already working. You need to start from a working good known state before you try and take the next step. And then finally, forgetting what your teachers told you, right? Cheat and look up the answer whenever possible. Number one, you know, your company is gonna be happier if you are able to get help, whether you're asking somebody on your team or in your user group or on a random forum online, if you can get to that result and understand what it is that you were doing in five minutes versus nine hours of you trying to hack your way through it at the command line and, and figure it out, your company is much happier with that five minute result. Now, searching and just copying and pasting code off the internet, number one, it's a little bit dangerous. Number two, all of us have a lab environment and only a few of us are fortunate enough to have a separate production environment to actually run these things in. So that's always a little bit dangerous, but Hopefully, you're also looking for not just how do I accomplish this one step that I'm stuck on, but how do I actually understand the process and where was my thinking wrong or where was the action I was trying to take not correct? So you can actually learn, you know, what you were doing incorrectly and, and what's the better path for it. And a lot of us in the community are absolutely invested in trying to help teach people and trying to help them to learn um, or, or how to figure things out on their own a little bit for this. So again, just look up the answers whenever you can or, or ask for help, right? The whole, you know, phone a friend thing or asking somebody else, your job is not dependent on you understanding and learning and figuring out in a vacuum everything you ever need to know for your job. It's just that you accomplish the goals of what it is. So leverage all the resources that you have available to you and absolutely, you know, look up answers or find somebody else's code and try and pick it apart and understand what it is that they're doing and, and why it works. The other thing I will say on this, I got some feedback when I was presenting this down in uh, Australia last year. Somebody said, oh, I have a really good way of, of asking for help and getting really good responses on a lot of my code. They said, I will go ask on Reddit, you know, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what I need to solve. Here's, here's the problem that I'm having. And he said, I will flip over to my alternate account and put up my existing code and say, oh, I did this and this works, you know. Because if you ask for help, occasionally somebody will take the time to actually explain it to you very well and nicely and in long form. But if you put up bad code on the internet, there's going to be a thousand trolls that come out of the woodwork to tell you how to do it more efficiently and like all the things you are possibly doing wrong in it. So I was like, that's not a bad alternative. So again, leverage any resource that you have available to you to try and, and figure this stuff out and reach the goals. So flipping over to the VMware specifics on some of this stuff, right? There are two different APIs that exist inside of the VMware ecosystem. 
And some of this is just for people that are entirely new to APIs. Um, when you're working with VMware, you kind of need to understand the difference on these just to understand what tooling um, you're going to use to try and access these, these APIs. So the original API that existed uh, from the three dot something days, you know, of back in like 2006, 2007, was this SOAP API. It's Simple Object Access Protocol. Um, it's an older API and it's actually a protocol and a standard, but this is what most of the Power CLI commandments use. This is what PyVMommy uses if you're doing Python. It's an XML based platform. It's very rigid. It's not very simple. Um, but especially for people that came into PowerShell in the early days of, you know, coming in at two and three, when you were having to deal with com objects, when you were really having to navigate and do a lot of, of .NET reflective sorts of things to try and investigate uh, objects that you were working with, it may not be that hard for you to understand what's in there inside of the SOAP API. And there are many, many, many more examples for usage on all of this just because of the fact that it's existed and it's been around for so long. But that's great for automation and if you are doing vSphere operation stuff the thing i'm trying to get everybody to kind of understand is like moving towards using the rest of the apis that you're going to see in in the world and, and really encounter which is going to be rest right so this is the architecture that's all the new vSphere apis there are some features that only exist in rest they're not backporting these to the other api they're not putting them in old commandlets there will be some places that there's some older core functionality of vSphere that only exists in the old API. But really what we're trying to present here in this session is how to leverage a REST API, how to go from doing things interactively at a PowerShell command line, understand the types of objects that it is that we're working with, and learn the basics of working with a REST API. Again, with just kind of the abstract of a virtual machine that everybody can, can grasp what it is that we're doing because this then translates to APIs outside of vSphere. As you wanna start working with other platforms, understanding the basics of how to use a REST API, how to read the documentation, how to use uh, an interactive interface that you can do things essentially in kind of like a swagger style. Um, or then, you know, if everybody wants to, we can even jump straight into Postman and actually go poke around against an API. These are the things that are actually gonna help you use other APIs outside of vSphere. So next, um, the tools that we're using, right? Obviously PowerShell and a Power CLI module, you know, I, I don't bury the lead, it's in the title. Um, so we're doing things interactively at the console. We're gonna use a couple of simple scripts to look to see what it is that we're actually working with and, and how we're moving from doing things interactively at the command line over to the API. We're gonna access the vCenter and the vCenter server appliance APIs. So essentially vCenter is the management platform for a cluster of resources inside of the VMware environment, right? And we'll show this a little bit interactively at the command line. But then the vCenter server appliance is basically the management of that virtual machine itself that's actually doing things, right? So two different layers, right? We have a management layer and essentially like a cluster layer, or this would be dealing with say, services on the back end of a, of a Windows server versus things that are being hosted out by that server itself as like a separate application, right? So there's two different levels of management that we're going to connect to on this. We'll dig in and, and at least make sure that everybody understands where to get the documentation about the older SOAP API. We will connect to the vCenter server appliance API for quick introduction and just looking at like health checks and some very basic things that we can do. Then we will flip over to the vCenter API for demos of how to actually create virtual machines through the API itself. Um, for these environments, obviously, you know, you need a vCenter server. So if, if you're not very proficient on the VMware side of this stuff, this is just because you're really only going to get the API access that you need to do a lot of these functions and do a lot of stuff with Power CLI by having vCenter server, right? All that management is baked into that product. You have the capabilities of downloading this and running it in a virtual environment. You can spin up uh, an eval of both vCenter and the, and the um, hypervisor servers for 60 days on an evaluation without any licensing. So you get two months if you wanna actually just build this out and play with it. Um, we actually get into the VMware API Explorer. This is hosted on the vCenter server and it's a, it's a Swagger-like interface where we can actually interact with the API itself. We'll cover where to get documentation about the APIs. Uh, and then for the actual code side of this, I'm using VS Code and then I actually use a, uh, a module that's out of the PowerShell cookbook uh, is the module that's in the PS gallery that has this really cool tool for show dash object where we kind of like investigate some uh, some objects and some properties that we're working with. So now we will go ahead and jump over to the demos. 
So we'll see. Hopefully we don't actually need the uh, the dumpster fire for this one. But all right, can everybody see the terminal? Yeah. Looks Hopefully good. it's decent. Okay, cool. Got it. Yeah. I I tried to be decent and actually flipped in a light mode for this and I, I hate it a little bit. But so um what we're going to go ahead and do here is we're going to take a look at uh, some objects that we have here. So for this, I'm going to start off with getting actually we'll just we'll just do the stopwatch. Right. So so part of uh, the thing that we want to see here is a little bit of overhead when we're leveraging older access methods versus newer access methods. And I'm just going to go ahead and run this code and we're going to stopwatch and then we will actually take a look to see what it is we're getting back in these things. And if my environment is running properly today, I should actually see that doing this get view stuff is a little bit faster. So we'll see if it makes a liar out of me or not. Okay, so um, smaller environment, right? In this, in this environment, I don't have a ton of virtual machines. Let's go see, I think I'm at, you know, maybe 50 or 60 or so. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah, 66 items. So not a huge environment, right? This is this is a functional lab. This this lives inside of my company, and, and we use it for all sorts of stuff. And I just like poking at it for demos. But digging into the code to take a look at this stuff, right? What we have when we're working at this overhead level here of using the native Power CLI commandlets for git dash vm, right? I'm getting all this and I'm trapping it in a variable and I'm feeding it in via pipeline to get all my VM objects, get a snapshot, and then select the object to just pull out two properties, right? This is something that is somewhat resource intensive to use the native Power CLI commandlets. So for anybody that has a VMware environment that is just trying to do minor process improvement of their code or trying to get better performance, I push everyone to start looking at getting uh, these types of objects of this Git view because going back to the core of the PowerShell stuff that we have here, right? When we run git dash VM, this object that we're getting back inside of this variable is essentially a, um, it's it's an object that has a lot of wrappers around it, right? It's gone through formatting. It's It's got its own PS1 XML files for, for like object types and for formatting all the results of everything that come back to it to make it look like a an object you would expect to work with at the PowerShell pipeline, right? Because this is back to us doing operational things. So when I look at what comes back from this uh, dollar overhead VMs, uh, you know what? I'm I'm jumping ahead. Let's let's leave that for a second. But just you know, this is us working in a PowerShell method to get these VMs here using this native commandlet. What I'm getting here inside of this fast VMs is something a little bit different, right? And and we'll we'll jump in and, and do some investigation because it's probably a little bit easier to see interactively at this command line. But even for these 60 VMs that I have here, doing the the git dash VM uh, native power CLI commandlet and piping this to git object and then just pulling out a handful of property names was 1.54 seconds. But doing it with this git view uh, commandlet that we have here was 1.28. Again, not not drastic, but you know, a quarter uh, of a second performance in an environment that's only 60 VMs. When you expand this out to doing with these things on on the scales of, of multiples of hundreds or thousands, that compounds a lot every time you have these these minor performance improvements that you can do. But I want to I want to kind of get everybody to just understand like again what what different things that we're working with here. So if I go look at these overhead VMs that are captured in this variable. What comes back is an object that gives me a name, a power state, the number of CPUs, and the amount of memory that's that's in this, right? Because this is what somebody would expect when they run git dash VM. They need like resource allocation, some of basic information about a virtual machine, if it's on or not, and, and what it has for CPU and memory, right? But if I take this and pipe it to git dash member to see what's in here, what comes back from this um, is this implementation object right it's it's an inventory object that's here i'll just shortcut and say that but it has a lot of properties that are very specific to doing vm operations right i've got the amount of memory i've got what folder it lives in what uh what networks it's on what resource pools it is and then there are only a handful of methods that are here which are really stuff that comes in from core.net and core powershell right putting things out to string getting a type of what it is 
These are not things that are real functional operations I'm going to do against a virtual machine. But in this instance, when I go get fast VMs, the properties that come back for this here, let me just select my first one. So we can take a look at a single VM. The thing that comes back with this is a little bit different, right? I don't have just an amount of memory and amount of CPU and whether it's powered on or not. What I get back is this actually like categorical view because this object that I get back from kit dash view is essentially the, the .NET flavoring, but it is like almost the raw API object that comes back from the vSphere API. So this is a category view of what are the capabilities of my virtual machine what lives under this config what lives under the layout which is you know files that are that are associated with virtual machine and then information about like the runtime of the vm or the guest operating system that's on here or or summary information from this and then it has things like you know which data store object is it attached to what network is it attached to but to to investigate these a little bit more let's go ahead and use that that show dash object commandment and one of the reasons that this is so heavy and so resource intensive to use some of these native power CLI uh, commandlets, oops, let's try to zoom in here, is that this object that comes back again gives me this, this VM operations view of what's inside of here, what resources are attached to this. But one of these things that exist here is this extension data property, which are the same exact results that come back from getting that more raw API object that comes back from git dash view. So it's heavier and more intensive because of the fact that vSphere essentially goes and gets that API object. Then it does all of its power CLI wrapper for this to run it through the type system, to run it through the formatting system and give you back a, uh, a PowerShell style object that you would expect to work with. Right. But it's because of the fact that you have all this additional wrapper to it that it costs us that, that extra amount of time to get some of these things. But to investigate again, kind of digging into like what it is that we have on the um, on the API side, again, using this show dash object commandlet within this category view that I have for the virtual machine. Uh, and, and even looking down here, the, the raw type that I have is a vmware.vim.virtual machine, right? It's not, it's not an implementation object. It's not an inventory thing that has a bunch of wrapper around it. This believes that it is a virtual machine that you can function with. So the methods that I have on this object are things that I would actually do against a virtual machine, cloning a virtual machine, taking screenshots of what's on there, you know, attaching and detaching disks, taking snapshots of it, doing clones, powering it on, powering it off, rebooting the guest operating system. And then again, from this category view, this is going to be more similar to what we're going to deal with with uh, a lot of other REST APIs. If I look inside of this config, category right for all my virtual machine config information it gives me what was the change version when was the thing modified what's the name what's the guest operating system name what's the uh you know creation date on this what was the uh version of virtual hardware that's here for it all these things that are re relevant to the configuration of a virtual machine are found underneath here and then you can even get into things like what are the files that exist underneath this so a lot of this information exists. And if you are somebody who is already running uh, vSphere inside of your environment and are running PowerCLI and just want process improvements, challenge yourself to go look at the information that exists under the extension data property that comes back from your native uh, PowerCLI commandlets and start shifting over to using Git view. And it's extremely, extremely performant compared to all of the PowerShell wrappers, and it gets you one step closer to actually kind of understanding what to do when you're working with an API and, and a little bit more of the raw category view to look at this stuff. So that's step one for performance improvements. We looked at the, uh, the .NET objects to see what exists here for this. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at, at interactive script and see what this stuff really, really looks like when we start getting into the performance level. So let me clear out my results here for these. Uh, Joe? Yep. We have we have Edgar who has a question. Do you want to take it now or? Feel free, yes, please. Edgar? Yeah, so Edgar? So Joe, I saw you made mention that the reason it's slow for Get VM is because it has that extension data within there, along with all the formatting that it does or mm -hmm. all the properties with it. If 
I'm not sure what could be done with this, but I, you said the get view is a lot quicker because you just get the object back itself, is essentially right. all the extension data in there. Mm -hmm. Would it be just as a performant if you just did get view and then just created like a format.ps1xml uh, format file and just did the formatting yourself? You you absolutely could. That would that would give you your default properties that would return in PowerShell. So if anybody's just looking for information, um, mm -hmm. then it would it would be lighter weight on the formatting and the properties for it. But it also still gives you that raw uh, VMware.vim.virtual machine object, so you can still take the methods against it. So you get the the benefits of PowerShell formatting on top of it, but then you still also have the benefits of, of having the raw object that you can take uh, actions against with all the methods that are there. That's that is a very very good option to do this. And really, in this, it's it's even like the expense on this was that I was getting the VM objects and saving them in a variable, and then piping it to get snapshot and getting the information of like what was the the virtual machine and what was the name of the snapshot itself. But then doing this through Git dash view that information already exists. I don't have to pipe it to anything else. The only thing I'm piping it to is select object to just filter out those specific properties, but all the information about the snapshots already exists from running git dash view and giving me the virtual machine object. I don't, I don't have the expense of piping it to a second command to get that information. So I'm just curious, this is just a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't it built that way in the first place? Just get VM is just a wrapper for get view and then just has its own view for, you know, to see all the VM properties. Yeah, you also have to think this was this was the initial, like uh, Power CLI was one of the very first, I mean, probably within the, the first 10 uh, actual third-party vendors that built modules to plug into the PowerShell ecosystem. And they were trying to do this to, again, kind of, uh, stick with the mantra of PowerShell and it, it being an operations focused lang scripting language and, and interactive console. So people that were doing actual operations or people that had invested in and learned PowerShell and how things were supposed to look and how uh, you were supposed to be able to do things like select objects where, where you would get a default list of, of properties that would be returned because somebody determined what that list was for you, or you could return everything if you wanted it. That was just, that was the methodology and that was how uh, PowerShell was built and how it was meant to function. So they, they kind of played along with it. Um, but it, mm -hmm. it is, it comes at a cost, right? There's, there's overhead or there's things that you, somebody who's a developer or somebody who knows like the vSphere side of it, that doesn't know PowerShell may not understand why some of these things were done that way or someone who knows PowerShell might be glad to get some of this, but then at some point you're probably gonna need the better performance and you need to know like where to go next. But it's it was just yep. kind of a necessary evil, I would say. Okay, I was just curious, because I saw the get view had a bunch of other properties in there, like the snapshots, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I saw hard disk in there, so I was just curious. Yeah, hard, hard disk is in there for, uh, it's that's uh, layout, let's see if you get it up. Yeah, hard disk information would be under like layout and layout ex. So storage is is like per data store storage. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking for your actual disks, that's layout disk, and then every disk that exists underneath here it gives you like what's the disk file and and full path and everything. So yeah, all of that is is here, um, and it's it's absolutely information you can go through and and dig through. Like even even guest information, this will give me back my guest OS information and even like what is the IP address with the, the FQDN that it knows about through VM tools passing information back out of the, the guest operating system. So tons of, of information that's in here and it's very performant to get it and also not have to use multiple commandlets. You just need to figure out where things are that you're looking for essentially. Okay, that clears it up. I was just curious why they were, they didn't wrap essentially get view and then just made its own formatter. Or it's yeah, a type and it would have been a lot quicker. I was just curious if they didn't know about the the ETS within PowerShell, the extension type system. No, that yeah. I mean, again, this was you know uh, I'm trying to remember the first versions of, of the PowerCLI module that came out were probably even still in the PowerShell two days. Um, I think it, yeah, it was it was definitely before PowerShell three. Um, so it's it's been around for a long time, but it was it was them trying to play nicely with the, you know, Windows or systems admins can can pick the stuff up interactively and just kind of like hack their way through it. So that's that was how a lot of these things were built. Um, 
and yeah, we'll kind of we'll kind of dig into it a little bit more here because it's a, a similar demo that we're doing here. But to show like the expense of of what this is when we're running Git VM, stashing this in a variable, then I'm going to get my snapshots and I'm going to get my hard disks that are here. Like, not only is this just bad code, because for anybody who knows PowerShell, right, we only we only get the one pipeline. So I'm returning three different object types back in this. Um, clear and run this. So the formatting is going to look terrible, right? Because I'm getting back three different object types, and it's just dumping these things back out here at the console for me. So I got my virtual machines, and in this instance, I'm getting every snapshot that exists inside of this environment, and then I'm getting all the hard disks for all the VMs, which... If that's all you're looking for, that's that's great. But it's you know, typically we're trying to get information out of these systems and into something else. And this still cost us 2.19 seconds uh, to do this little bit of of piping of these objects here. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off and run this script and let it go, and then we will dig into the script and see what it is. I'll make sure I'm on my not connected one because this actually connects in and runs this. So. Again, some of the power of just understanding what it is that you have in the objects that are here and understanding some basics of, of how to do some PowerShell things, right? This is me building a function. And I wrote this when I worked at uh, Veeam specifically because there's an open tool that exists in the market that if anybody needs information out of a virtual environment for, for VMware specifically, you just run RD tools, right? And it will export everything to CSVs or to Excel spreadsheets for you. Um, it's a great tool it's very very performant because it's actually written with uh i want to say that one's compiled c sharp and it runs against the, like the native raw api objects and returns everything back but that is an executable that you basically go to i think it's rvtools.net you you could just go download the exe file and run it inside of your environments and there were a lot of security folks that did not like that but that was what we used was that output um, from RV tools to do a lot of our sizing for how to back up virtual environments. So to kind of strike the balance on this, I said, okay, well, we can still get the information that we need and I can output it so that somebody running this script in their environment can give me output that is that I can attach to this the same as if it were output coming from that RV tools tool, because I know exactly what goes into those CSV files or spreadsheets. We can still get our sizing data, but I can show this to any security person and they can see what it is that's getting run inside of an environment, right? Because it's human readable PowerShell stuff to just run, import in this module or this function, right? Just, just dot source the script to load it into memory and run this function called git dash VM data. And all it's doing in this instance is it's going and getting all of my collected VMs. And then for each one of them, it's just building me a custom object to give me like what's the name of the virtual machine, the power state, all the information about the guest OS, primarily in this instance, just so when we're giving information back to the customer, they have things that are relatable to them. Like we know here was all the information we gathered about the system ahead of time. So you can verify that this is all correct when you're, when you're double checking our work basically. But then I'm just creating, you know, some simple array lists and, and putting things in here to just make custom PS objects to give us a decent, um, results on the on the back end of this thing, right? But then again, right, for all my disk information, I need information about what's the type of disk, what's the capacity, what mode is the thing, and make sure we're not gonna encounter any problems when, when we as Veeam were functionally trying to interact with this to, to do uh, backups, right? So in this instance, I'm grabbing all this information and what you can see is when we run this thing interactively here at the command line, whoops, what did I not connect? Ah, shoot, okay. Hold on. I forgot I did remove this, so I did actually need to be connected. So let me script interactive, copy this again. Here is mine. Okay. So here we had 2.19 seconds. I will just go ahead and run it in this one where we are actually connected. Okay. So this took 1.15 seconds uh, to get this, but let's do CD to my output. Uh, and we want code VM disk results and then code uh, VM results. So this code that ran here took 1.15 seconds to give me back this information compared to 2.19 doing it in this method with the .NET 
or sorry, with the with the native power seal, I can inlets and doing a little bit of piping because it's just an expensive operation. When I come in and look at this though, let's do CSV convert to table. So in the CSV, I have way more information than just a name of a snapshot and a disk that exists on all of these VMs, right? What I have here is all the information about every virtual machine that's inside of this environment to have at this point, this is kind of like our, our, you know, key data to be able to align everything else that we're doing uh, downstream from this. But with all my disk results, the level of information I have from this is critical stuff that we need, right? It gives me all the state about the disk, the capacity. Is it a raw RDM? Is it, you know, a persistent disk mode? Are we going to have problems when we're trying to back this stuff up? And the capacity data that I need for us doing um, our input validation, essentially, for, for helping a customer size an environment. And it's not a pricey um, operation to do as long as we're using more efficient ways of doing the stuff in code and it's in a human readable format, right? Somebody might need to know the basics of what it is that we're doing with like a PowerShell custom object. But anybody that, that understands the basics of getting an object inside a PowerShell and typing dots to get all the properties or methods that exist a level down can follow along with this and, and at least have a pretty good idea of what it is that it's actually doing here. And again, the closer we get to the APIs and the raw objects without as much formatting and things like that, um, and as we move to other systems that don't actually have uh, PowerShell commandlets, right? This is going to help us in the future when we're when we're moving towards working with APIs a little bit more. <sighs> this next example, I honestly just have in here because this is this is where I have to remind myself, you know, use the right tool for the job. I had somebody who reached out to me that said, "Hey, I need to make some changes on on a bunch of ESXi hosts in my environment, but like." we don't want to just write a bunch of scripts. Like I know I could hack this together and I could have Putty go launch a bunch of things and just have it go run a bunch of you know, shell scripts against this stuff, but we want to make it PowerShell. I'm like, okay, let's go dig into it. Let's figure out what we need to do. So on the vCenter server appliance, when you connect in, it normally gives you an appliance shell. So it gives you operational things that you're doing against that management layer, as opposed to dropping into a bash shell and having like root access on this, this virtual appliance itself. To make this change functionally, all I have to do to change it to the bash shell is type in shell, change shell, give it slash bin slash bash slash root and log out. And the next login, you will drop into that bash shell. To change it back to this appliance shell, you run chain shell dash h and you do slash bin slash appliance sh as the root user and log out. The next time you log in via ssh, you get to this appliance shell, right? So three lines of command versus two lines of command to flip back and forth. But because partially we were being obstinate and wanted to do this via PowerShell, we had to go dig into running posh SSH to do wrappers for shell sessions to like be able to read a stream and send credentials and send keystrokes and send stuff back to us, read through that. I ended up with 58 lines of code to do this stuff in PowerShell rather than doing these two lines, right? And three lines to flip the shell back and forth. The other thing was actually getting in and working with this in the API itself is much, much easier. So I'm going to go ahead and actually just SSH into this thing real quick. Mm -hmm. Just to say, one of the other things that I really like about using this tool to teach everybody this is when you SSH into this, this vCenter server so appliance, right, at the appliance level the itself, it actually has APIs that you can interact with here. So if I want to look at the APIs, it tells me right here, do help API list, and it shows me all the APIs that are here. For anybody who's coming from PowerShell, right, this is not completely different from if you're old legacy PowerShell enough, right, actually working with like old school com objects. But anybody who can stare at the screen can say, oh, look, everything has this default root of com.vmware.appliance. You can zoom in a little bit and see if it will. I don't know. Uh, Once it converges now, right? I should have just zoomed in my terminal a little bit more before I got into this. Appearance 14. Yeah. I can Let's see do it fine. 18. Okay, cool. All right. Well, yeah, then I'll just quit squirreling. Um, 
but so every everything we're connecting to here with API has this root of com.vmware.appliance. Then it gets into like what's the actual API endpoint that I'm connecting to, right? What's what's the URI that I'm starting with? So whether I'm doing my health service, my monitoring, my recovery for backups, right? Doing things with older versions of the APIs that were defined here for access and local accounts and monitoring. This is a really interesting view to show people that are not used to using APIs, but are comfortable with PowerShell, right? Because you can just basically like type in, here's the root of what it is that I'm trying to get to, dot, whatever, and keep going one level deep until you get this stuff. And each of these ends with a, like either a get or a set typically, other than, with, than things that are like a list or a query, but pretty common words that you can kind of guess what this thing is going to do for me here. So if I want to get information about yeah, the I health guess. for system, I can just interactively yeah, type this com.vmware.appliance.health.system.get and it gives me back green, right? right? So at least we have Not super one. hard. The other thing that's interesting here is just the way that this is laid out, we can actually see one of the first concepts we need to kind of think about when we're gonna start working with APIs is they have this versioning system, right? Sim similar to uh, semantic versioning that exists for applications that we're going to have and that we're going to install. There are going to be versions that you deal with on an API and typically going to the next major version is where you may or may not have breaking changes. So the older V1 of this API had some things that were functionally here in every one of these words. But as they were trying to make improvements, they moved over to the newer like version two. So they retitled everything as, as version one for the older stuff that existed in the core of the API. And as they built new things, they changed it. I'm not a huge fan of how they how they titled it and, and everything that worked previously, you had to add in an extra dot version one to get to those, those URIs and those endpoints. But it's nice to at least be able to see at, at a glance that you know, here is something that was a different version than, than what exists here to just get everybody kind of comfortable with this concept of, of what it is here. Now, specifically for um, vCenter and as we're working with the APIs, right, we have developer.vmware.com, which has all the documentation for the things that it is we're going to get to, right? So if I go into APIs, this is where, like I said, there's going to be the two different API endpoints that you're going to work with. If you're specifically actually trying to do API stuff for vSphere, you're going to have the vSphere Web Services API. This is that older SOAP API that's been around forever and ever. Or we're going to have the REST API, which is the vSphere Automation API. When I go to this API reference, the nice thing about this is, again, thinking of this in the PowerShell perspective, trying to make this thing functional for people that are doing operations they wrote this in a way to make it accessible for somebody who is brand new to APIs and to try and make this something that you can interactively walk yourself through, right? So the actual demo that I have for building VMs is really just running through this, getting started with vSphere REST APIs in five minutes, right? Step one, you authenticate. Step two, you have to get a session ID that you repeat and send back in, in every one of your calls afterwards. So we connect to this API sys endpoint to get a session ID and then send that back every time we're communicating back. It's essentially just capturing a variable and, and passing it back in. And then we actually go through this step of creating your first virtual machine. For anybody that's that's used to using a system, especially if you're doing you know command line or GUI stuff, we already do the authentication, right? That's just you logging into any system. Then all we're doing at that point, right, using a session ID is not completely dissimilar from having any sort of authentication token that you have that just gets passed back and forth to whatever platform that you're that you're working in. This is going to be a very common thing you're going to do with APIs. So just understanding that it's not completely different from what we do currently. You just need to understand like what are the specifics of how you authenticate to something and then how do you properly send it back the, the credential or the ID or the cookie or whatever it is that you need to. Um, this is typically in the documentation. For other platforms, it's not quite as easy because they don't write it as like you're working with an API for the first time. Here's how you do it in five minutes. But we will go ahead and jump over a little bit and and take a look at this stuff. I'll uh, I'll skip the doing some of the appliance shell stuff interactively because just seeing it at the command line and, and kind of learning how to navigate it, I feel like it's pretty good. So for this, what we're going to go ahead and do is I need to update this because this is still written for my home lab instead of this lab environment. Uh, but if anybody has any other questions, we can dig into stuff while I'm 
editing some variables. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. So for this, right, for the first interaction we're going to actually do with our, our API, we're going to do this still through native PowerShell, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm just setting a variable with my vCenter server. I'm constructing this URI, which really just, again, we're, we're working with all like HTTP endpoints, basically. So I'm just putting this stuff together to build out my variable to say, I'm going to connect to HTTPS, my vCenter server name, slash rest, and then the URI that I need to connect to is this com slash VMware slash, sish, uh, slash session, which is everything that's covered here in this whole first minutes, five minutes of working with the API, right? We just, we go in, we say, create a session. It's going to tell me that I connect to this API session endpoint. I send it my authentication or my authorization, which is just a basic type. And it's a base 64 encoding of username colon password, right? So that's exactly what it is that we're going to do here. I get my credential, right? So just get it the way that we would normally expect in PowerShell. I get a prompt. We take this as username colon network credential, the password that we're passing into this thing. We put it in the format of header authorization so basic with the base 64 encoding that we're doing for this thing. And then we pass this back using invoke rest method. So let's go ahead and run this and then we'll start seeing what sorts of things it is that we're actually getting back. Let me jump to a clean one. Okay. So I will get my prompt. Let's see. Did I get, no, I probably had the one password in here. You know what? That's really, really cheap. We're just going to go ahead and pass in my administrator credential because why not? Uh, what am I? Yeah, I'll take your password. But again, let's look at that. Data. Sorry, I'll normally I do this in my home lab environment, but I was not about to trust, you know, airport wife. I go into that. So I'm going to tweak a little bit for doing it in the, uh, in the work lab. But let us clear and try this again. Okay, so I'm going to get prompted for my credentials. So, yeah, so, yeah, make sure that only can get the yep, copy. There we go. So, I've now passed this thing in. I ran invoke rest method. The method was post because I have to post in this information to it. What I passed along was my header, right? Authorization basic was the type. My authentication is base64 encoded string of username, password. And then tell it the URI is just this this long uh, string that we had constructed previously of uh, server rest and then the rest endpoint that we're connecting to. And then I'm skipping the certificate check just because I have self-signed certs for the lab, right? And I'm just getting back what is the value of this authorization response. And from then on, the header that I have is going to be this key value pair of VMware-API-Session-ID and the response that came back, this value that came back from running invoke rest method. So if we actually go take a look at this, the auth response that I got back is just this, right? This is my token that I pass back and forth from now on. The documentation tells me I have to send VMware-API-Session-ID equals that, that key, right? So this is what we're doing. We're sending this stuff back and forth is using this session ID in the format that it shows us in the documentation. And every time we call it to the API, this is this is what we're using, right? So again, this will exist for the documentation for a lot of APIs. It just may not be quite as easy. You might have to search around inside the docs to understand which endpoints you're trying to connect to and how to pass your authentication. A lot of times um, this will be documented in its own section, at least to make authentication easier um, or, or separate than doing actual operations against an API. But that may differ based on the platform that is that you are connecting to on this. So at this point, when we have this, um, this response, this header, right, for this token that we have to send back and forth, 
Now we're going to actually get back to working with that, that VCSA API that I showed that was in the command line in that SSH session. So here, I'm just going to take that base URL of HTTPS slash server name. And in this instance, I'm now connecting to different API endpoints. I'm going to get to my appliance system version, my appliance system uptime, and then my appliance health uh, application management, or sorry, appliance management. And this is all just, again, like doing string concatenation in, in PowerShell. None of this is anything that's super magic. And I'm just capturing this stuff in variables so that then what I can do is I can go fetch my data. My version response information is doing a get with the REST API. I pass it that header. I give it the URI of this version endpoint that I'm trying to connect to here, appliance system version. And I tell it again, skip certificate check. So invoke rest method is, is going to be the PowerShell command that you are going to use if you are poking APIs natively through PowerShell. It's not difficult to, to learn. There's tons of documentation and stuff that's out there for it. Um, and, and as you will see here, it's just really not that hard to take all the things you already know about PowerShell and start working with an API. So for this raw view, I'm going to look at this version information that comes back in this response. And this is going to be your introduction to JSON if you've not dealt with it before. The info that comes back from this um, is just kind of gnarly. Here, it'll be nice and do git member instead of my aliases for GM. Oops. <laughs> Laptop keyboards. Right. So what I'm getting back is this PS custom object for this value because it's trying to figure out how to deal with it and how to wrap it. But because I see that it has this value note property, if I do version response dot value, what comes back is the summary of my appliance, right? Here's this specific patch. Here was the install date on this. Here's the product. Here's the build number. Here was the release date for this. Here's the type. And then here's the actual semantic version number that comes from this vCenter, right? And all you have to do is understand how to navigate things, which anybody who's who's using basic PowerShell can figure out. I need to do dot property name, right? Or pipe something to Git member and just be able to see what sorts of things are inside of here. It is not entirely different when you're working with APIs. And if you want to take this information and do like new and interesting things with it to get some of this stuff, all you really need to do is work on capturing things inside of variables, right? So we have that raw response for the version. If I really want specific version info and to be showing this stuff, then here, let's, that is out of order, right? If I just want quick checks on my version information and my health, and I only want to return the values that are here because I've investigated this and I know what these properties are, I get exactly my bird, my uh, version number. I get specifically all my build information, which I should have done that one after as well. Right, I get the exact version of build and I get a green, yellow, red health status for this for this appliance, right? So it makes it very easy for you to do dashboards or do reporting or tie other systems together because you have figured out how to do basic interaction with an API and how to investigate these objects and these properties, which is not completely different from the thing that you're already doing inside of PowerShell for this stuff, right? And then if I really want to do interesting stuff, right, I can take my, my uptime value and actually do it into a time span to see, like, how bad have I been at patching because I haven't actually, like, rebooted the server in forever, right? So 63 days since I've rebooted this vCenter server, and it's, it's behind on patches and other things. But you can find this information. You can consume it in whatever way you want. All it takes is a little bit of investigation to kind of understand how to interact with the system and then go find the information that you need or find the operations that you need to do and, and how to make those changes inside of an environment. So for the last step, we're going to actually jump over to working with the, the API interactively in here. So let's flip to the API Explorer. So inside of vCenter, we have this thing that's called Developer Center here, right? When we get into Developer Center, it'll drop you to this overview which will give you links to the documentation, or we get the API Explorer. If anybody's ever seen a Swagger interface, it's not completely different. It functions in, in a lot of the same way. This was just the wrapper they wanted to put it in for, for vCenter to make it look more similar to other interfaces that existed for a vSphere product, right? Not make it a developer type experience for it. 
But again, one of the nice things about the way that they wrote this and trying to put APIs directly into the hands of, of VMware operators, they formatted this so that the first thing that pops up in your API category for vCenter to do actual management of my virtual environment is this VM thing, right? So I can get my VMs, like I can get information about the first 4,000 um, virtual machines inside of an environment. I can get information about a specific virtual machine. I could delete one if I wanted to. Or we have this post action, which was the thing that was documented in the whole first five minutes of working with the REST API here. To understand how to go create a virtual machine, it's, it's easiest to go back and look at the documentation for this that was here in this getting started guide. Oops. Uh, other window. Here we go. So for creating your first virtual machine, this is a post method against the API for create VM. And this is just a prettier view of the documentation here. So all we have to do is feed it some information, right? We have to give it our session ID, right? Which was that, that header that we've already got that's constructed. And we have to give it a request body. So it's going to be some JSON information that we send to it. For the virtual machine spec, all I have to give it is what is the guest operating system what is the placement of a data store in a folder? I even specifically give mine a cluster just because that way when I do my demo environments, I know exactly where to go look to clean things up afterwards. But for guest operating system, especially coming from the PowerShell perspective, this is essentially the same thing as doing a parameter set validation. You have to give a, a specific enumerated type which means these are the only functional values that exist for this, right? So if I want to tell it that I'm going to go build a Windows Server 2012, I actually tell it that the guest OS type is Windows underscore server underscore 2021, right? Or if it's FreeBSD or if it's Ubuntu or CentOS, whatever, you have to know what these values are. But most APIs are very good at documenting these things. Again, if it's especially if it's a, a set list of things you can give it, they're going to be pretty well defined of what those things are to pass back and forth. So all I need to do to create a virtual machine is give it, you know, an enumerated type on a guest operating system and tell it what data store, right? What, what, what bit on disk does it actually go into? And like, what folder does the inventory object land on? That's it. This is not going to be functional, obviously, right? It's not going to actually let us create something that we can then turn on a virtual machine from this. But this gets us to step one. We've created something. We figured out how to connect to the API, how to authenticate to it, how to pass information back and forth. And we've actually gone and done something, whether it's, you know, simple copy and paste. But creating an API via or creating a VM via the API is a, a really good first step for people to understand. Um, if you really want to see all the options that are actually here under this show optional properties, this will show you everything that exists inside of the virtual machine spec that you could do. You don't have to do this. And as you're going and creating these things and figuring it out for the first time, look at the other things that you already have that exist inside of the environment or go create something the normal way that you would do through the CLI or through the GUI and then go look at it on the back end and you can copy that and change values to understand what it is that you're going to do. For VMware specifically, instead of having to run a bunch of gits to get like every data store that's in my environment or to get every folder that's in my environment to know what these are, you are going to be passing a string, but the information you have to pass back is the actual ID, right? It's a managed object reference ID for this particular data store or for this folder. The nice thing, again, with it being vCenter in this is all I have to do is I can browse to one of my data stores for this flash deck ISO, and it actually shows you up here in the URL. Here's the server I'm connecting to slash UI slash app slash data store. And inside of this navigation, it tells me the VM Nami object type is data store. And the actual object that I'm working with here, the, the object ID that I need to pass into my API is this data store slash 804104. If I want to get my VM folders, same thing. I go to this API demo and I look under here and it tells me the folder ID is group dash V803142. Some of this stuff, you might need to learn a handful of tricks, or you might need to actually read the documentation to see where you can find this information. Or if you want, you can go run gets against any API. Those are always safe. It should always be safe, I should say. But once you learn where to find this information and, and how to use it and how to interact with it, this stuff becomes kind of simple, right? You can, you can start teaching yourself things, or you can, you can leverage what you already have inside of an environment to go do these things. So I'm going to go create a basic VM from the API, right? We're calling it PowerShell-API-VM underscore manual. 
I'm setting the guest operating system to DOS because why not? And I tell it, here's a data store, which is actual underlying disk that it goes on. Here's a folder. Here's the ID for that. And then here's a clone. Again, just because this makes it easy for me to find and, and clean my demo stuff later on. But this is not super difficult to understand, especially since I'm using VS Code, right? You can you can see the JSON, you can do proper formatting, you can have it auto format stuff on paste based on the fact that it knows the file type and the language mode is JSON, right? Tools will do a lot of this heavy lifting for you or, or keep you from making mistakes on this stuff. And if I come in here to this API Explorer, I'm in this post method, I go down here and for my request body, I paste it in. The vCenter API is also very nice in the fact that when you tell it execute, it's going to pop up a warning and say, are you sure? Executing this API will cause modifications to your resources. Are you sure you want to continue? Instead of just running it, it says, are you sure right? you're going to do this thing? Especially when you're doing deletes, you might want to double check that you have the right thing. But when I execute this, right, it'll actually give me back the curl. So if you wanted to paste this, you know, back and forth inside of, uh, of a bash shell or something or inside a PowerShell and, and want to actually see all the stuff that's getting passed over and how this JSON gets formatted into all the key value pairs and everything, you can actually see this stuff. Another really cool tip with this is if you are looking at developer documentation that has the curl commands for things that you were trying to do against an API, there is a good PowerShell module that is curl to PS that will take this curl statement and actually convert it over to all the stuff that would go into invoke rest method. So if you can find developer documentation on running curl against an API, there's a tool that will basically convert this back to how you would do it inside of PowerShell. You might need to tweak the code a little bit, but it gets you 99% of the way there with like very, very little lift. And the thing that happens with this is when I ran this, uh, unable to allocate resource. Ooh, what, 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 what happened here? Hold on, let's see. Error type. Uh, authentication required. Oh, you know what? I bet my, my authentication probably just timed up. Let's try this again. Flash deck vCenter VM post. I want to go create my VM. Okay, request body. Let me try and still copy here. Paste, execute. And what I should get back is a 200 response. Yep, here we go. So the response that comes back from this is actually the, the ID for this VM object itself, right? 805178. If I go look, just because I know this is the folder where it actually ends up in, if I refresh my view here, I get my VM. If I go into the VM, because it's a virtual machine type, I can also see that same matching ID, right? VM-805178. Again, not functional. I get power this thing, I wouldn't do anything. It doesn't have a disk, doesn't have a network, but you have made step one and you've figured out how to copy and paste, you know, stuff into an API to go create a virtual machine. That is not a bad starting point for this. If you really want to get fancy with this stuff, you know, then you can actually do full VMs. This is one that I've done um, where creating this full VM, like I can copy and paste this stuff straight back into the, the API Explorer, where all I did was take an existing virtual machine that I had inside of my environment and basically change some values, like what network I want it to be attached to, what, um, what folder I want it to be in, what storage I want it to live on and things like that. But I was able to just, you know, swap out a handful of values and then I know exactly what I need to do to put inside of here to create a fully functional VM. So I will run this and we will see it. Yep, so giving back the response of this, this VM ID that's here. If I refresh my view again, this one I will actually go ahead and power on. Uh, and to the hosts, y'all can let me know if we want, we can divert for uh, another couple minutes and go into Postman, or I can just tell everybody that exists in a recording elsewhere and, uh, and we can keep moving on because I know we're a few minutes over. Mm, I think we still have time. What do you think? Okay. All sure. right. Cool. So yeah, for this instance where, where again, I copied and pasted a bunch of stuff out of an existing VM inside of my environment. Uh, this is me actually booting into, uh, uh, server 2019. Um, this is a custom ISO just because I've, I've actually injected the drivers for like the, the pair of virtual SCSI adapters and stuff like I had to slip stream, stream drivers into this. But we can see with this one where I actually went and created this, like this actually boots up to a functional Windows system ready to do an install, right? So it's, it's not a very far leap to go from what was my basic uh, formatting of this to the 
to the second one because all I did here was copy something that I had that already exists and figured out some things that I needed to change to, to make this one a little bit different. Um, to get the real experience of, of some of the stuff you're gonna deal with when you are working with an API, we are going to jump over to Postman and fingers crossed this demo environment will cooperate today. Let's see. Okay. Yep. Session expired. Well, that'll be fun. Okay. One second. Let me get out of my bit warden. Okay. Oops. Oh, sorry. Google authentication, not. Yeah. Forgot I switched that one. There we go. Okay. Knew there would be something I hadn't quite tested right before we started all this stuff. Okay. Let's get into workspace for Power CLI API demo. So. Again, not entirely different from the stuff that we saw inside of the documentation for how to interact with this stuff. The first thing that we're gonna do is go create a session and I'm gonna get an existing virtual machine then I'm gonna go create a VM. Let's, why are these not opening? Open in tab, open in tab, open in tab, okay. So the first thing that we need to do is just to authenticate in this, right? So for my for my session, I have this uh, hard coded in here. I'm going to this vCenter server and then um, slash API slash session for this, right? And I have my demo that's here. Let's see if this works for me. I'm just yeah. required yet. Administrator at least from that local, we will just. If this will send this time authorization cool so it gives me back my my header right this key that we have here in the in the json just to zoom in a little bit here by just me passing in authorization right i'm telling its basic type i gave it a username and a password and sent it over this created my session for me so what we want to do with this stuff from then on is run our say git vm so we have this variable here where i have set up an environment Ooh. I don't have an environment on this one. This would be fun. Um, all right, you know we may not we may not run this one interactively because um, I don't want to go set up environment variables real quick. But essentially, instead of right making making small minor incremental improvements, instead of me having this hard coded value that's inside of here inside a Postman, I have the concept of doing essentially what are environment variables that you're going to have on any system. You can create an environment. You can set values that are in here. So I can actually set that the, the fully qualified domain name of my vCenter server is this flash deck vCenter, right? Then that's a variable that automatically gets passed in on this. The other things that we can do with this is when I run this create session, I can actually have it capture the credentials or the, uh, the session ID that comes back from this and also put that into a variable. So I can feed it back this VMware session ID and it will automatically uh, create that header and pass it back by it just understanding what this object type is and how Postman uses that to, to connect to and from an API. And then similarly, when I'm trying to do a create VM, these endpoints that I'm connecting to are exactly the same. Fully qualified domain name of my vCenter server slash API slash vCenter slash VM. But the only thing it changes here is the method that we're using for this, right? Getting my VMs is get, creating a VM is a post. There are also potentially options for put, patch, delete, uh, or other options, right? This is all just the basics of dealing with an API and understanding your uh, HTTP endpoints that you are connecting to. But API documentation is almost always written in a fairly easy to understand way that if I go back to look at my API Explorer, it's gonna show me for the methods of a VM, it gives me my post, my get, my delete. Even the colorization of, of this documentation for an API is typically going to be standard, right? That you're going to match, like, even just the colors to understand what it is that you're doing and know that, like, red is something that's dangerous. So by just going in and learning the basics of some of the stuff, uh, in this instance, there are actually code samples uh, that you can use um, entire Postman collections where you can just download this collection, import it into Postman, and start poking around with the APIs 
without you learning how to construct all of this. And you can teach yourself things by looking at somebody else's examples that already exist on this. Once you have figured out how to do this on a system that you can access or something that you are comfortable with the concept of the platform you are working on, then you can say, okay, now how do I use an API to go connect to something else, right? So I challenge everybody to just go learn how to, how to pull something from like the weather API or go pull from like the NASA API to go get like the, you know, the, the space images of the day sorts of things or pull and find out what your local weather is this week and next week um, because those are good, interesting challenges that are decently well documented and are simple um, almost hello world style uh, interactions that almost everybody can follow along and just read the documentation and kind of hack their way through it and figure out how to interact with an API. And once you do it a handful of times, it's easier to understand the process and what it is that you're doing and, and really get yourself just to that next step. So um, with that, that's, that's, that's really it. So I hope everybody enjoyed or got something out of it, you know, nothing completely burned to the ground so very We're cool okay. <laughs> no i think this uh, this was for me this was super interesting um cool it's the thing you showed and um we see a lot of applause here so i think people <laughs> in the audience liked it too so awesome. really 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 great stuff so um i think i, ha I have to start playing around also with this get view um okay. Because I, what I did, I'm only doing little things at the moment. Uh, it was very, very small environment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm solely using PowerSeal I as mm -hmm. it is at the moment. But the things that, that you showed really gets me. Uh, yeah, I will. I will try this. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Looks. Looks. Looks nice. Very, very, I think it's really useful information. Yeah. Yeah. Very practical stuff. Yeah, let me go find. Uh, I will make sure I post in the chat before I jump off. I have uh, I have the examples for all of this code already up online, and again, I've got I've got recorded versions of where I've done this in the past. So if anybody missed anything or wants to go see it, um, we've got the recording from this, and then I have previous recordings that were that were slightly different on this stuff, and then the actual sample code if anybody wants to follow along with. So I will I will post that up. Cool. Very cool. Excellent. Yeah, and it worked from the airport, so everything you know, <laughs> connection worked. And uh, yep. I was wondering if you could con if you can concentrate because you have all the background noises, you know. Yeah. But it worked yep. very well. So fortunately, cool. I've done this enough times that I've I've you know had the expectation of this yeah, is normally what fails or things go sideways all yeah, the time. So, so you know, you're a pro. This guy's I mean, a pro. Obvious. Yeah, absolutely. You're a, this guy's a pro. Obvious. He can probably do it in Kansas with a tornado going around him. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So um, yeah, if, if you have a link, I mean, I've put the link to to your LinkedIn of, and your 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 uh, Twitter account mm -hmm. already, so yep. people can follow you. Yeah, I'm gonna put in the link. Uh, so actually, I'm just gonna link to the code from where we did this at uh, at PSConfiU this year because for that instance, I also had some of this that I had pre-run inside of um, Jupyter notebooks or the Polyglot notebooks. So even if somebody doesn't have an environment, I have some kind of long form, like almost written like blog post style where you have previous runs of, of my code from the environment that you can follow along with. So hopefully it's helpful. Perfect, very cool, thanks a lot. Yeah, so um, again, great stuff, Joe. Thanks for, for being with us. Absolutely. So when, when, when is your flight? Uh, we board in about an hour, so I think oh, I'm going to try and okay. go. Have a drink and chill out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well awesome. deserved. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Okay, Joe. Thanks a lot. Uh, we talk again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for Great. having me. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks, thanks Joe. That was really cool. Thanks. Yeah. Very cool stuff. So yeah, we're we're a little late, but I I think I still maybe I I just take a few minutes to show you what um what I what we put into the to the agenda as a second topic, which is um. Just show you a little bit of PowerShell script runner chat GPT stuff um, that we just um, recently added. And uh, let me just hop over to my environment here. And uh, so basically what I wanted to show what, what I want to show you is uh, is actually three things. Um, kind of a follow-up from the previous session we had with with Doug. 
when he introduced us to the Power PowerShell AI module. And um, I want to show you how how this could be something you might want to add. Oh, that I want to show you how you could add that, for example, into Script Runner, and then maybe we can talk about this if this is total nonsense or just a technical gimmick. Uh, and um, then the third the third example would be I just want to show you how you can directly create a new script from scratch in Script Runner, which I think is pretty cool. So what what um the first thing? So I've I've already installed the Power PowerShell AI module here, and I have registered my OpenAI key. Um, so if I start doing something with the PowerShell AI module, with the what's, and it's still using the um, GPT-3, I haven't start using the four. I could, but well, I'm I'm just using the the three for this example. And um, yeah, what what can you do? What what is the idea of the module? It's, it's like okay, um, communicate with ChatGPT via PowerShell, right? Uh, and say okay, what are the top ten? Just as an example, um, come on, let's. And um, so what happens now in the background with the registered um, Open I key? I get some information back, and then I can say okay. Uh, Describe every command led and show two examples. Examples. Okay, let's see what happens. So, yeah, okay. So, what we can see that. Okay, it's uh, don't, we don't see everything. I'm gonna just go back here. So he, it, okay, it's end. It ends with the uh, the fifth or the sixth um, commandlet, and that's because um, there is one one uh, parameter here, which is the max token, which is limited by default. So the the data that comes back is uh, limited by default, but you can change the max tokens size and then we should get a real top 10 list yeah and now it's top 10 and then of course we could say okay i want to format it in in html and i want to export it into a variable and then create a html file or a table or whatever so um yeah that's that's uh i think already great stuff uh, because and and then you what you can also do um just to also show you that you could use uh the, the copilot function in the module and say uh Create a function to uh, find blocked words, for example. And what it does, it comes back with the code. And then it, additionally, it allows you, you can say, I want this to be ex explained to me, or um, I could uh, directly get this into my VS code for some pretty cool stuff. Now, what I did with this module, and again, it's maybe just a technical gimmick, but um, I just want to show you it anyway, um, is that I took this module and I created in script runner what we call an action. An action is a use case where you want to allow people to do something. Like could be VMware, could be like in this case, ChatGPT. So the idea is instead of doing something on the command line, I could say I could do the same thing as just now. Uh, show me that top 10. Porsche command lets. And maybe we say uh, format markdown, maybe like this. And um, so if we're lucky, we get some some data back. And so the idea of, of, of using this interface, so the question is why I'm done, why I'm, I'm not going natively to the chat GPT window. Um, it could be somebody maybe in your organization and maybe chat GPT. Um, might not be allowed for everybody, or you want to have some kind of measurements and control around it, monitoring stuff like that. That's exactly that's exactly what you can do. Because um, again, very simple example, just but to show you the idea. If I'm typing in a word which is a blocked word uh, in this case, which is uh, Heiko, makes perfect sense, I know, but it's just to give you an idea. Um, yeah, it it doesn't allow you to to do that. So you have some kind of, some kind of control and you have a web hook URL 
uh, why is that in here? I can show you that quickly um, because what I did in my script, I am documenting all the communication in this Teams channel here, whether it's uh, successful, like, okay, there's some data coming back or if some information was in there that would not allow the execution. And um, we have the info about which user triggered it, from which IP address, what was the prompt, was, and, and the result. Now, the way that it works very quickly is that the un, in the underlying script, um, I have a couple of things. Of course, I have a um, couple of variables. That I need a key. I need um, the question and I have the webhook URL. By the way, the, the language right here, so could be different. So if I'm going back to this example here, I'm switching to French, which I don't understand, but uh, you can get the idea. So this information can be can be multi-language if this is something that's interesting. But OK, what else happens? So we, we provide additional variables like which was the user, what was the IP address, what action actually got got triggered, what script on action, which is kind of the use case. And we have a, a, a list of, of, of block words, which of course is again, very basic. I, I call a function um, that is going to check and iterate through the, the text to find if I have block words. If that's the case, I'm pre preparing a message that I'm going to push to the, to the Teams channel. If uh, no blocked words, I'm doing the import module, I'm setting the OpenAI key, and then I am doing the get GPT-3 completion commandlet, and I'm coming back with a result, and that result ends up then also again in a Teams message that I'm sending via another function to, yeah, to the Teams channel. Now, and so and that the way that this works in in the configuration also to show you that quickly is that in the configuration which is this action here let me communicate with chat gpt i have a ps credential which is the open ai key which is mapped to the key that is actually part of the centralized configuration here it's it's kind of a secret credential that i have that i have stored here in in my in instance here and um, and I have this web the question and I have the webhook URL. And of course, typically what I would do is I would say, okay, nobody needs to know this webhook URL, so I set it to to hidden, and I save it. And then if I go back and I open this again, then we should not see this webhook URL again. So this is this is how you can kind of simplify the the experience for the user. So again, it's it's, it's a technical. Um, thing that I that I played around with and um, yeah it's I find it pretty interesting to to kind of take this into this direction and and work with chat GPT but the last thing uh, I think is the is the uh, even the most interesting one because what what you can do if you have an open AI key so you have an account and it's configured what you can do is you can use um, this chat GPT integration and say, okay, uh, I want to create a new active directory user. And if we're lucky, and Jeff GPT is in a good mood, then we should get not only the, the, the code, also some, some command that's back, but what should happen is that it already has a well-structured PowerShell script. It has a synopsis. It has, um, as we saw, this language prefixes for, for these four different languages. That should already be part of it. And it actually also, if we're lucky, is using a specific variable already that defines what kind of message I'm getting back when I'm running such an action to, for example, create a user. So. That's the result. Like this is already kind of in the system message. That, that's kind of the, the secret sauce, right? The reason why this simple sentence uh, leads to this is that we have, and I can show you that in a, in a minute, in the configuration there is, is a system message that already sh tells JetGPT, okay, use these pr language prefixes to do some translations to, to these four languages. We want to have a parent block. We want to have a try catch and finally block. We want to have. We want to use splatting. We want to use this specific variables. And so, the nice thing about that is, 
it's instead of starting with a blank page, you have already a well-structured PowerShell script to start with. Is it perfect? Will it work right away? Probably not because it's JetGPT. It's it's not the super magic stuff. But um, again, instead of running and 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 uh, uh, starting from scratch, I think it's 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 a uh, I try to avoid the word copilot because it's, I think it's overused. But it's a it's a it's a smart companion that helps you to to to, to kick things off, which I think is pretty cool and. But also what you can do also to show you that is that that's, of course, creating something totally new. And as if you have already worked with JetGPT and PowerShell, you might know if you try to do something with um, things like MS Graph, the results are really poor because, well, they, they collect the data until 2021. But if you have things like AD or VMware, the things that I... Um, so as where I would say pretty decent, I would say, yeah, let's put it this way. Okay. Uh, and so another thing that you can do is if you have an existing code, you can either write mouse click or here, click on the dialog and say, uh, uh, create a function again, like the example from before, extend function to find blocked words. And then um, let's see. What the result will be <clears throat> okay so it comes back kind of i would say with the same same result as we more or less like we saw previously so yeah again i think chat gpt is not the answer to to all questions that's still 42 i think but um it it helps you to to kind of navigate and add things in your scripts or as i showed you um yeah create new scripts so if you're interested that's what i wanted to show you that power, the PowerShell AI module itself already is a great benefit, I think. And as you might know or not know, but DuckFink is kind of almost constantly adding functions. Uh, I think he's not even sleeping. And um, the, so that's really cool. And yeah, integrating it into like, for example, things like script runner, I think is a, is a real, is a really cool thing. Yeah, so that's, uh, that would be it. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to try it out, um, feel free to, to do that, of course, uh, or ask me additional questions. And so I think with this, we can kind of sum up our two days session, I would say. Well, cool stuff. Uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah. And maybe just already looking into the future. If uh, so, uh, by the way, if you know Bruce Payet, who was one of the, the uh, first members in the PowerShell team back when Jeffrey Snow started to build PowerShell, we have a Ask Me Anything session tomorrow at four o'clock Berlin time. If you if you're interested, go. You're very welcome to join us on YouTube. And then in October we have the PSConf MiniCon. A little online event. It's just an afternoon, but I think they're, go they're going to be some interesting speakers. I think uh, Chrissy, Chrissy, I think is is uh, Chris Lemay, I think is uh, is speaking, and a few others. So that's going to be interesting. And we might have some some big news uh, in a in a few weeks because um, as we have started doing our things online. We might have, or probably, well, we found a location, right, Ryan? We we went there like three, four weeks ago. Yeah. It, I'm trying to remember how many weeks uh, the days are blend, uh, blending together right now. Yeah. But yeah. Um, looks like a very good location. Yeah. Yeah. So so when if everything works fine, our next meetup, which is planned for November, will be a hybrid one. So of course we're still be going to be online there. If we are, there is uh, all, all the equipment is available there, and um, yeah, but we keep you posted on the date and also the speakers and the content. But for the people who are in the region here in uh, Germany, Heidelberg, Mannheim region, I hope to see you in in person. That would be really cool. But again, we will keep you posted. All right. Oh, there was a question. I didn't see that. Uh, would it be able to prompt 
GPT to read your piece history to create functions of your most used one-liners? Um, yeah, if the I would, yeah, if, if you have the data available. Um, yeah. yeah, so you, you can do a Git history to uh, pull yeah, up your thanks. recent uh, PowerShell history there. Um, I haven't had time to toy with it yet, but it should be possible. Yeah, I think so. All right, so again, thanks for joining. Um, thanks for Joe, who is not here anymore, but hopefully already in the plane on the Boston airport. And um, have a nice evening and hopeful, hopefully to see you soon in another meetup or another event and um, keep on scripting. Thanks everybody for taking time to join us. Um, hope today's sessions were interesting for you and uh yeah it'd be awesome if we get to meet some of you in person in november so um yeah stay tuned <laughs> bye bye take care bye thank you bye thanks ryan thanks heiko bye 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 bye, -bye.